when we think about Hebron, Hebron is the place where God brought mighty men to David. God knit their hearts. And what you've got to understand about these men that came to David, that many of them were more talented, more equipped, uh, better uh, at, at, at accomplishing things than David was ever. These were mighty men. These men could have on their own done amazing things and did do amazing feats on their own. But God brought them and knit their hearts to David because there was a, 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 a task that had to be accomplished. Lynn Howes posted something this morning or yesterday, I guess it was 21 hours ago. I read it late last night and when I saw it, it just spoke to my heart. And, um, you know, he's going to be here in a couple of weeks. And Lynn said, my assignment is not just getting people saved to go to heaven. It is getting them saved so that heaven can come to earth. The burden that I feel is that how do we understand that if every one of us on this planet was born of the Spirit of God and led by the Spirit of God and the kingdom of God is operating in the hearts and lives of every single person on the planet, nobody would be looking to go anywhere else. And the task feels monumental, and I'm saying that because here's what I want you to understand. I can't do what God's called me to do without every one of you maturing to a place where we can accomplish together what God has for us to accomplish. Now, I'm going to get into the message, and it's, 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 I, I, I hope I can articulate my heart and God's heart to us. And I'm just asking God to give us ears to hear what His Spirit is trying to say to us as a church. Now, Hebron is where we learn to relate to people not on the basis of what they can do for us. You know, most of us, you, 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 you relate to people and have a relationship with people for what they can do for you. I can t tell you, Mike Murdoch is one of the greatest at talking about that. You go to an attorney for what he can do for you. You have a doctor, you have a garbage collector, you have a, a people of all things, and you, you have them in your life and you have a relationship because of you have a need and they are somebody who meets that need. We, we, we have a relationship with a pastor where, where, where we go because we have a spiritual need and he is the breaker of bread to the Word of God and we go and because of that need we come to have our hearts and our souls fed. And when we understand that we can relate to people on the basis of what they can do for us, but we come to a place in our growth and our maturity in the Lord where we're not entering into a relationship just about what they can do for us, but in God's rec in recognition of what God brought us together for. God could have sent you anywhere. He could have birthed you anywhere. He could have provided a job for you anywhere on the planet. But for some reason, He brought us here together at this time, at this place, for a purpose and a reason. 
And I'm asking the question, God, why have you brought us together? Here's what I know. I know you are in Christ. I know you are righteous. I know that you are an overcomer. You are more than a conqueror. You are victorious. Why? Because God's Word says, and we've been taught, that's who we are in Christ. But why are we here? Think for a moment. He chose us. He expects us He expects us to grow up, to mature into a mature son or daughter of God where we begin to realize He is for us and we are for Him. We're on the same side. We're on the same team. It's not us and God. It's God in us, with us, one with Him, with a plan and a purpose that He has. I really believe that He has placed us together for a purpose and that we're not only in covenant with Him, but we're in covenant with His family. We're in covenant with His body. We're in covenant with His church. Think about that for a moment. You come to a place where in your walk with the Lord, you're not just with Him because He can meet your need. You don't just walk with Him because He can take care of you and supply everything. You're in a covenant relationship with Him. He wants to move us beyond babyhood, immature, carnal relationships for us to come together and be of one heart and one spirit in Him. Now in 2 Samuel chapter 2, it says, it happened after this that David inquired of the Lord, saying, Shall I go up to any of the cities of Judah? And the Lord said to him, Go up. David said, Where shall I go? And he said, To Hebron. So David went up there, and his two wives also, I can't pronounce their names, Verse 3, and David brought up the men who were with him, every man with his household. So they dwelt there in Hebron. Then the men of Judah came, and there they anointed David king over the house of Judah. And they told David, saying, the men of Jabesh Gilead were the ones who buried Saul. Now here's what I want you to see. The men who came to David at Hebron had a different motive in coming to him than when they came to him at Adullam. Instead of coming to David like they did at Adullam to have their needs met, they came to anoint David king over Israel. Now at this point he was just anointed king of Judah, if, if I could say it that way. It's also interesting to me that we're dealing with this with everything going on with the, the king yesterday, you know, and, and what happened with, with King Charles. And that goes all the way, I don't know if you all realize, you realize that that ceremony goes all the way back to David. Did you know that? It goes all the way back to King David and Solomon and the, 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 the things involved in that and how it was. Charles wanted to do something a little different. He's a little more new age. And the bishop said, no, we're doing it this way, the biblical way. I thought that was pretty good. But it's amazing 
that this is going on at the same time that we're in this series and God is doing something that has uh, uh, sparked the world or, or, or shown to the world and then we're here looking at something that's, that's just similar. And I'm just saying, God, show me what you want. Now, when these men came to David at Hebron, their relationship with David was no longer based on need, but on the realization that God had brought them together for a special reason. When we recognize and understand how God sovereignly moved, do you realize God has sovereignly moved in some of our lives to bring us together for this time and this place for you and I to meet one another and to begin to honor God and honor each other whether we get anything out of the relationship or not? God, why have you brought us together at this time, at this place in history? Listen carefully. Why did God bring you here? We got to understand this. We got to find out why. I believe that he placed you here not for just what I can do for you or what you can do for me, but what he can do together through us. My heart gets overwhelmed at times when I begin to realize the people who have spent time, effort, dollars doing what we've been able to do in not just our community, but in the facilities and everything that he has brought us here to do. And I realize that it's more than just what we've done in the natural. God is faithful in the natural, and he's been great to us. Many of you have sacrificed, you've given, you've... It's amazing. One can put a 1,000 to flight, two, 10,000. What we can do together is far more powerful than what any one of us can do on our own. All of these men that God brought to David could do mighty things on their own. When you begin to read the story of the things they accomplished and what they did, it's amazing what, what they accomplished on their own. But they came and pledged themselves to David to do a purpose for a bigger thing. Now, Hebron is a place of covenant. Hebron, to give you a little history, is 20 miles southeast of Jerusalem, it's on the same chain of mountains where Zion is found. But the interesting thing is that Hebron is actually at a higher elevation than Zion. It's the highest city earthly in natural Israel. The name Hebron means seat of association or seat of affection. It means being joined together. It means true fellowship. So we say that Hebron means fellowship and covenant. That's what it means. It's the burial place of the covenant fathers, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. This is the place, if I could say it this way, where the rubber meets the road in relationships. What happens in relationships? I personally believe that covenant making is the highest spiritual place you can come to in the body of Christ. A lot of Christians have convenient relationship, not covenant relationship. There's nothing higher, in my opinion, than the Christian life 
than the ability to make and to keep a covenant. Now, you say, Pastor, why, why does it matter that this is the, the that Hebron is at the highest elevation? Well, Adullam was a place that was very easy to get to. You, you, you just, it was in the valley. It was in a low place, and it, it was easy to find. Nobody had a problem getting to Adullam. But Hebron was a hard place to get to. It was out of the way. There are no good roads there. To this day, there's even by car, it's not an easy task to get to Hebron today in a car with roads because it's such at a high elevation. It's steep, it's rocky, and it's very dangerous. Everybody could, you, you, you didn't go to Hebron just because you was out on a, on a Sunday afternoon drive. You have to get out of your you have to go out of your way to get to Hebron. It's difficult, inaccessible, and you've got to scale rocky, steep cliffs. I can say it like this. Keeping covenant relationships. Keeping covenant relationships means pain. Marriage is a covenant. Piece of cake, right? Huh? It's easy. Don't y'all think it's easy? Well, I mean, I've learned the secret to marriage. You have a father-in-law. You have a son-in-law. You have a mother-in-law. And you have a daughter-in-law. What's a wife? The law. <laughs> I don't go. I don't go with my message, but it is. It's a lot about the covenant. When you're in covenant with somebody, you may go through some pain. You may go through some struggle. Everything isn't easy. Not everyone comes to Hebron. Now, I want you to hear me when I say this this morning. If you come to Hebron, it's for one reason, and that reason is just like David went there, God told him to go there. And if you're going to enter into a covenant reason, you've got to understand God's telling you to go there. It's the will of God for you to go there. It represents the highest spiritual position you can come to in Christ. You don't come there by accident. You come there on purpose. You come to Hebron committed to the Lord and to his people. Now, let me try to position this so everybody here understands what I'm saying. Most of us, all of us really, when we came to Jesus, we came to Jesus because he meets our needs. We had a need. We needed a Savior. We came. He accepted us. We come with our needs. He's a need meter. He does that. He's our healer, our deliverer, our redeemer, our miracle worker. All those things are a reason that we come to Jesus, and there's nothing wrong with that. But then, after we're walking with him, he brings us to a place where we not only appreciate how he laid down his life for us, but if we're going to be like him, we're going to have to lay our life down for him and for others. See, that's a struggle to tell people that. That's why it's, it's so frustrating to me the way the body of Christ puts people in and out of the kingdom 
whether they're going to heaven or hell, and they're missing the whole point is you come to the Lord, you're going to heaven. Heaven's not the issue any longer. It's a matter of whether you're going to grow up and mature and walk in everything else that he has for you or not. Are you going to begin to act like Jesus, live like Jesus, lay your life down to accomplish what he put you here to accomplish? And you begin to understand there's a bigger purpose in this other than just the selfish reason of whether I go to heaven or not. Listen to me. Being willing to lay our reputation and our life down for him and for our brothers and sisters, no matter what it costs, is not an easy task. When you come to Hebron, Hebron you come to make covenant. Most of the church world that you and I are a part of lives at a duel. Pastor, what are, you, what are you saying? Well, most everybody that comes to the Lord and most every church is built on meeting the needs of the people and that the only reason God is there, they will come and, and, and I'm not, I'm, please understand I'm not trying to be critical, I'm trying to point out something that we've got to understand about growing up and maturing in the body of Christ, but everything is built, God's here today and the only reason he's here is to meet your need. If you have a need, you come to Jesus and the whole Adulam crowd is based on that and most churches are built on that premise. I'm not being critical. That's where it starts. That's where it begins. There's nothing wrong with that. It begins in that understanding. I'm, I'm not being critical. But there comes a time when God expects us to grow and mature to a place where we get our needs met and we become need meters. Again, I'm not saying it's wrong. But we need to mature the, to the place where there's more to it and we accept responsibility as adult, mature Christians. Hebron is an act of your will. It's a choice that you have to make to have more faith in God than you've ever had before. I love reading Hebrews 11 when I look at the men of faith, the women of faith that's described in the 11th chapter, the faith chapter of Hebrews, where the Bible gives a list of saints who died for this kind of faith. It wasn't just about them. They laid their life on the line so they could do what God called them to do, to save somebody else, to do something for somebody else. They are the men of women of faith who accomplished great things because they had come to a place in their relationship with God where, where, where God walked with them and covenanted with them, and they covenanted with God. It was something greater than their own lives. God wants to bring us to a faith that is higher than we've ever known, where we relate to a person, not because he can bless you, but because they're a child of God. In 1 John, everybody knows John 3.16, don't they? Everybody knows John 3.16? Well, let's go to 1 John 3.16. 1 John chapter 3, verse 16, look at this. By this we know love, because he laid down his life for us, and we also, and we also, and we also, look at somebody and say, hi, we also. <laughs> and we also ought to lay down our lives for the brethren. Like I said, everybody knows John 3.16. Everybody don't quote 1 John 3.16. Notice what he's saying. And this we know love. I think he's saying this is what love is. Ever since I read this verse and been meditating on this verse, been singing that song. 
Better know where love is, young man. This is what love is. Love is laying down your life for him and for one another. Because Jesus laid his life down for us, we ought to lay our lives down for one another. I see such joy on your faces. (laughs) What are you getting ready to say, Pastor? This kind of love takes great faith. Great faith. What do you mean? Let me try to explain it to you like this. Here in America... We have a standard of weights and measures. In the standard of weights and measures, if I go to a butcher shop or I go to a grocery store and I walk in and I say to them that I would like a pound of meat and the butcher starts cutting sums and he hands you something and you say, how much is it? Well, that's only 14 ounces, but that's good enough. In my opinion, that's all you need. Is that acceptable? Huh? Do you know actually they can be prosecuted for that? They sure can. Why? Why? Because we have a standard of weights and measures. A pound of meat is 16 ounces, not 15.5 ounces or 15.9 ounces. A pound of meat is 16 ounces under the standard of weights and measures. Government has guaranteed it to be 16 pounds. Now, God set the standard of what love is. He set a standard of what love is. Comes from his word and in the name of Jesus. Now listen to me. Do you want the standard weight and measure of love or do you want what you think is close enough? Pastor, I gave them 15 ounces of love. Isn't that close enough? Doesn't meet the standard. Well, I gave all the love I know how to give. Does it meet the standard? Look at somebody and say, it's tough. Uh, Yeah, this is tough, but hear me. Hear my heart. Hear what I'm about to say. God said the standard of love was laying your life down for your brother. Hear me say this. When, not if, when the body of Christ starts living to this standard of love, we won't ever have to worry about betrayal, evil speaking, gossip, slander, or murmuring. We won't ever have to worry about those things. What's more, when we sin or when we make a mistake, we have the security 
that our brothers and sisters aren't going to reject us or throw us out because we know that they love us irregardless of what we say or do or how we behave. Why? That's the standard. They're willing to lay their life down. They don't get into this funk of, did you hear what they did to me? Do you know what they said about me? I went to church and they didn't act nice to me today. We don't ever do that, do we? No. My goodness. State standard of weight and measures. What do we do to people just because they make a mistake? How do we measure love? Well, Jesus is the measure. Jesus is the standard of love, and his standard of love is the same in any country on the planet. Say this with me. Say, the standard of love, standard of love is Jesus. Jesus. Rob, when you said it last week, it hit me. This is it. Here's the standard that we've got to meet to be like Jesus because he is love. 1 Corinthians 13, where we started this whole thing a couple of years ago, on a new portrait of God. Here's the portrait of the body of Christ. Here's the portrait of the mature Christian. Here's the portrait of who we should be like. Here's the portrait of Christ. What is the love standard? Well, it's 1 Corinthians 13. Just listen to this. Love is patient. Love is kind. It does not envy. It does not boast. It is not proud. It is not rude. It is not self-seeking. It is not easily angered. It keeps no records of wrong. Love does not deliver light in evil, but rejoices in the truth. It always protects, always trusts, always hopes, always perseveres. <laughs> Pastor, what are you describing? I'm describing Louis Moyer, Ruth Miller, Donna D Jones, Abby Frank. Why? They're in a covenant with God that walks to a standard, and what's the standard? Now, let me just stop, because some of you right now are feeling like I felt when I started preparing this. I was sitting there going... I can't preach that, Lord, because I don't need any of that. I just don't measure up. I've lived my life giving people substandard to who you are and still say I represent you. I don't feel like I can do it, Lord. I just, I just can't do it. And he did speak to me. He said, well, good. So get up. Go do it anyway, and know I'm doing it with you and through you, and I'm going to help you. I said, Lord, what are you saying? So I called my covenant brother, Will Compton. I said, Will? I just, I, I just don't know if I can preach this. Oh, buddy, you're the greatest thing that ever hit the planet. You're the best preacher on the whole world. He begins to just edify me and encourage. He begins to tell me, you can do it. 
Nobody can do it like you can. Why? He's my covenant. What would happen if the body of Christ started encouraging one another that you can do it? You can walk in everything that Jesus said we could walk in. You can be patient. You can be kind. You can not envy. You, you can not boast. You can not be proud. You can always tr be trusted, always in hope, always persevere. You can do all of that. But if you don't, won't change my love for you. Why? Because I'm in covenant with you. Do you all know how many times that I felt like that everybody on the planet was against me and I get alone with God and I begin to bellyache and moan about how bad I'm having it and how tough it is? And he says, well, the good news is I'm still here with you. What else you need? Well, let me ask you a question. If he'll put up with your foolishness and stay with you, why can't you stay with somebody else's foolishness? Why? It's called covenant. Covenant. Now, we don't love people just because they're worthy of our love or because they're nice to us. That's called convenient love, not covenant love. We love people to honor Jesus who died for them. The sin that you're holding against that person, Jesus gave his life to set that person free from it, and now you want to crucify him again by you holding that sin against them when he's already settled the issue. He's already took care of the problem. He's already forgiven them. See, we want God's forgiveness and we want God's love when we mess up. So when those who are in covenant with him mess up, what should be our response? Forgiveness and extend mercy. I'll tell you, <laughs> there's so much judgment in churches. This heaven and hell mindset, it's like they're always looking for something that they can attack or find wrong with somebody else and because of our own insecurities, and I don't want to get into all that, but, but I'm just simply saying, what would happen in a church when the church would begin to extend grace and mercy and love like Jesus did. To everybody in the world. When Jesus loves somebody, he loves them with the cost of his own life. He set the standard. Covenant love says, I'll lay my life down for you. Here's what convenient love does. Convenient love. Convenient love says, Pastor, I love you as long as I get to sing. I love you as long as I can be an elder. I love you as long as you'll let me do what I want to do in the church. I'll love you if. That's convenient love. But if you don't let me do what I feel called to do, I'm out of here. It's what convenient love is. It's not covenant love. 
covenant love is love like Jesus loves. It's love that can be counted on. It's love that you can build a friendship for life. Listen to me. David spent seven and a half years. See, we read this and think he just went up to Hebron and became king. David spent seven and a half years in Hebron before he became king of Israel. What do you mean? He lived there all this time before the ten tribes ever accepted him as king. Judah accepted him immediately, but seven and a half years before all the other tribes accepted him as king. What are you saying? Hebron is where David learned to live in covenant. Y'all understand we're trying to take this about going to Zion to a place of where we rule and reign. Y'all understand that? You want to rule and reign in life? You want to be responsible? We're going to judge angels? I mean, the body of Christ is powerful. The church that Jesus is building is amazing. The people that are kings and priests unto him, are, 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 it's an amazing thing to rule and reign with Jesus. But here's what we've got to understand if we're going to rule in the kingdom of God, your word better mean something. Your character better stand the test of time. Saul was the one who just wanted to look good in front of the people. But David was the real deal. And listen, don't you understand David had a lot of flaws and faults? But his heart was a heart after God. It's okay to have flaws and faults if you understand where your heart is. But Hebron is where David learned covenant. Covenant is something God wants from all of his people. Now, as again, I, I, I'm not going to finish Hebron today. Not sure if I'll finish it, but in, in I don't know how many weeks it'll take me. But as we begin to look at this, as David, as as his men followed David, what happened was they realized that this David was not just the answer to their financial problems. He's not just the one who was going to wipe out Saul and give them a new place in his kingdom. That's how they all started. They all started coming to David with needs. We all. But that's not how they finished with God. Church, we all started with needs. We all started with problems. We all came to God with struggles and difficulties. And we still have some of those things. But that's not how we're going to finish. David's men came with all kinds of problem. They saw David as God's anointed man with character. And as they saw what David did, they changed. Think about this for just a moment. I'm about to wrap it up. David was captive over the rebels, the malcontents the distressed, and those in debt. That's who came to him at Adullam. Though he was the captain of rebels, David never became rebellious. He was persecuted by corrupt authority, Saul. Saul literally persecuted him and tried to take his life. But he maintained an attitude of submission to that authority. He would not take Saul out. David's character and his conduct, conduct towards Saul and to what those men saw in David changed all those who followed him. His godly attitude and behavior was displayed in front of rebellious men who didn't have a clue what the word character meant. However, 
In the end, they became men of character. In 2 Chronicles chapter 11, beginning at verse 1, it says, seven and a half years after I read from 2 Samuel, then all Israel came together to David at Hebron saying, Indeed, we are your bone and your flesh. Look at me. We're Christ's bone and Christ's flesh, his body on this earth. Also, in time past, even when Saul was king, you were the one who led Israel out and brought them in. You shall, and the Lord, and the Lord your God said to you, you shall shepherd my people Israel and be ruler over my people Israel. Therefore, all the elders of Israel came to David at Hebron, and David made a covenant with them at Hebron before the Lord, and he anointed, and they anointed David king over Israel according to to the word of the Lord by Samuel. God, why have you brought us together and for what purpose? We need to continue to be faithful in natural things all the days of our life. We need to continue to be faithful in need and meet people's needs and have our needs met and walk through a dulem as men and women who understand that there's always going to have needy people with you. There's coming a time, and there is a time now in our lives where our walk with God is about a covenant relationship with God and with one another. I'm humbled by what I've watched God do. the people who have laid down their life, given their time, their talent, their gift to serve God and with us. I am enamored by the mighty men and women of God that he has placed in this church. And all I'm saying to us is, He's not done. He's not finished. We're going to continue to be faithful in natural things. Anthony, when I pulled in Friday night and looked at the grass cut and the parking lot and all of the stuff, looking so good, I could have kissed you. I'd been out all week, and, 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 and you come back, and, and it, you, you know, and you ride around, and, you know, he thinks I just drive around looking for weeds. <laughs> I do. <laughs> and every time I ride around, I see all the wonderful things that are done. But I still see needs. And I want to meet those needs. I want every need that we have met, everything taken care of. If there's a need arises, we want to fix that need and go down the road. But I also ride around and walk through these buildings thinking people have been in covenant to build and establish. And how many relationships with God 
and touches from God will happen somewhere on this campus. God's not done with us. It's a miracle. I didn't even look at my watch today. And we got plenty of time. Stand with me for just a moment, would you? Wonder what heaven would look like. Wait a minute, let me rephrase that. Wonder what the earth would look like if Jesus' prayer, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven, if everybody on planet earth was doing the will of God Who would want to leave? Well, Pastor, you know, the Bible says when we die, we go to heaven. Yeah. I think Jesus has conquered death too, and we're going to live eternally. And, 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 and somehow we're going to have to get those dead up. And we will. Why? Wow. Because heaven's not a place on a planet three miles south of Mars. Heaven is a people with God alive in them, caring for one another, loving one another, being everything that God is. If you just want to make heaven a place, you don't understand all. Where's God living right now? Let me ask you a question. Is God in heaven? Huh? Yes, he is. And you know where he's at? In you. God is in heaven and he Jesus is the throne heaven and he's in. Do you all understand? Omnipresent means everywhere. Oh, but that's, oh, I forgot. We don't meet the standard of weights and measures with, you know, all God can do is what I say he can do. It's not what he said he could do. You, do you understand how we violate the weights and measures? We don't walk in his love. We walk in our love. Now, listen to me. Don't you try to tell somebody else how they need to love you. His love isn't telling you how to love him. His love is, I love you, and I'm going to continue to love you. It's about what you can give, not what somebody else is doing. Religion tries to meet the standard for everybody. Lord, help us to love. Help us to understand covenant love. Lord, I... I struggle with how difficult this is and how are you going to manifest this through me? But Lord, that's where I need and we need one another to help us. Because Lord, when we begin to see your love manifested, it becomes joy unspeakable. It is full of glory. There is so much that could be said or done. And Lord, I love you. And I thank you for that love. Help me, Lord, to love like you love. Help us to make the choice to go to Hebron and to walk in this love. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord.